We are now in Holy Spirit One, class number five, and we're going to read some scriptures here, and then we're going to talk about six qualities of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason that uh, we do some of these things and repeat some of these verses is because of the fact that how many of you know you don't get to know a person the first time you meet them? So it takes, you, you, you spend time with a person, you get to knowing them a little better and a little better and a little better. And so as we continue to look through these scriptures, we're getting better acquainted with the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to get acquainted with Him, then we become more familiar with Him so we can begin to recognize when the Holy Spirit is, is trying to tell us something or lead us to do something. It's just we get acquainted with Him and we understand. And, of course, those of you that are, that are married, you know that in a marriage, a husband and wife really get to know one another better every year they're, they're together. And, and they begin to know what to, you know, uh, get one upset, so you don't want to do that. And you know what makes them happy, and you want to do that. And so it's as we get acquainted with the Holy Spirit, we begin to know when He's prompting us and speaking to us and leading us to do something. And so... It's like say we repeat a lot of the things in this class, but it's on purpose. It's by design because we want you to get intimately acquainted with the Holy Spirit and how He ministers. And see, if we understand how He does something, then when He wants to do it, we can cooperate with Him. And we don't have to sit around and say, I wonder if that's the Holy Spirit or is that just... So you get to know him and you know how he acts and, and you can cooperate. So here in John 14, we've read these scriptures, but let's read them again. Uh, beginning with verse 16 of chapter 14, once again, these are the words, last words of Jesus. And he's teaching them about the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 16, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. All right. And then uh, in the same chapter, turn over to uh, verse uh, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said to you. And I'm going to go ahead and read that next verse. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And one reason that he's saying that, and he started off the chapter with those same instructions. You know, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You know, it's amazing how many people do not realize you've got a choice of whether you've got a troubled heart or not a troubled heart. Jesus said it twice here in these scriptures that you don't let your heart be troubled. And the first time he's talking about uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on and, and begins to tell them, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not. And then over here, the verses we just read, he's telling us that you can uh, not let your heart be troubled. Why is that? Because the Holy Ghost, 
whom the Father is going to send, he's going to be with you. And with God with you at all times, why should your heart be troubled? And, and we need to see we can control uh, how our feelings and our emotions are because of the, of, of the way God has left us. So let's get into these uh, six qualities that Jesus enumerates here in these verses of Scripture concerning the Holy Spirit. And the first one that he gives us here in verse 16, he is the comforter. And he uses that terminology uh, many times over. And this is one of the times that you can use a concordance or a Greek interlinear or New Testament or Vines uh, dictionary, Greek dictionary of New Testament words. Sometimes it's good to look up these words that are English and see uh, what they were in the Greek and the, the meaning there. The reason that I don't do that very often is because you can just get off on rabbit trails and begin to make the words and the scripture say something they don't say. But here, this is a good time to kind of go back and look up that original word <coughs> because it gives you a little insight. And so the word comforter in the Greek is a word that's uh, parakletos. And uh, anybody in here speak Greek? Then it's parakletos. <laughs> and, and that Greek word means to speak to. I'm going to go slowly because it's important you get this. Uh, parakletos means to speak to, to speak cheerfully to encourage, call to help, legal advisor, pleader, proxy, advocate, one who comes forward in behalf of and representative of another. Now I'm going to read that out again. Parakletos means to speak, to speak cheerfully, to encourage, call to help, legal advisor, pleader, proxy, advocate, one who comes forward in behalf of and representative of another. So he's telling us the Holy Spirit is a comforter He's one that is going to speak to us, that's going to speak cheerfully to us, that's going to encourage us, who's going to help us, that's going to become our legal advisor, plead our case, be our proxy, be our advocate, and he's coming forward on behalf of and representative of Jesus. So in this, basically, uh, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm sending one who is coming on my behalf and representing me. And he said to these disciples here, he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. And so he says to you and I, that one that was likened to himself is going to be in you. You know, we sometimes, and, and you know, I don't believe God makes us uh, feel guilty about it. I, I don't think it's anything that's, that's you know, going to cause us to mess up and miss heaven. But we do sometimes take Scripture so, uh, I don't want to use the word carelessly, but I don't know of a better word. When, when Scripture is very distinct about something, do you realize that you and I, have come to the place, and we're very comfortable with, about talking about Jesus in us. You know, we even sing songs about Jesus in me loves you, and would you like to receive Jesus into your life? And y'all all heard that terminology, right? Do you know it's not in Scripture? All the places that, and especially in Paul's writing, he makes the clear distinction that it's Christ in you. Christ being the spiritual manifestation. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's positioned 
who his person is and then the spiritual side of him. So basically, it's Christ in us, which is the spiritual aspect of the Son. So basically, it's Christ in us, which is the spiritual aspect of the Son or of the Godhead. And like I say, I don't think it upsets God. I don't think we, we're going to get any condemnation or get booted out of heaven because we make the terminology Jesus in us. But Jesus is the flesh part. And we don't have the flesh part of the Savior in us. We have the spirit part, Christ. So it's Christ in us. So when we talk about Christ and we talk about the spirit, we're talking about what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, <clears throat> when I go back, I'm going to send another one like myself because I am spirit, soul, and body. And your spirit, soul, and body. And I'm not going to come into you physically, but I'm going to come into you spiritually. And he's saying, the spirit has been with you all this time. Well, certainly if Jesus was with them, the spirit was with them. Because the spirit never left Jesus. So where Jesus went, the spirit went. Now we're beginning to understand that same truth. That where we go, that's where the spirit of God goes. That's the reason we can say, and it's not being, uh, it's not bragging, it's not boastful, it's not arrogant. It's just a fact of the matter that when you show up, God shows up. And we need to begin to develop that confidence and walk in that confidence and realize that, hey, we're not just natural men and women. We're supernatural. Because this comforter, this, this person that Jesus has sent to dwell in us that's likened to himself, representing him, he says, I'm going to give you another comforter. Now he's saying, I've been with you. I've spoken to you. I've spoken cheerfully to you. I've encouraged you. I've helped you. I've advised you. I've pleaded for you. I've put myself in your place. I am your advocate. And that's described over in, in uh, the epistles of John. And he says, you know, I'm coming forward in behalf of and representative of another. And he's saying, I'm representing God. Now he's saying this one that's coming is another one that's going to do the same thing that I've been doing here in the flesh. He's just going to do it in the spirit. And once again, this is one of those mysteries that our little carnal mind will never be able to grasp. But that's the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. And so where one is, the others are also. And yet we know uh, to try to teach, uh, we sometimes make the differentiation, and, and they, they do have different assignments. And so if we were to, you know, just try to understand this with our, with our mind, we'd see the Father seated on the throne, Jesus is at his right hand, but the Holy Spirit's living in us. But where the Spirit is, so is the Son. Where the Son, so is the Father. And so uh, I better get off of that real quick, or we'll all... Be banging our head against the wall saying, it's too much for me. <laughs> so the things of God, the scripture says, have to be spiritually discerned and spiritually understood. So I just accept these truths by faith, even though there's no way I can explain it to you. But the fullness of the Godhead dwells in me bodily and in you too. And so we need to see that. So Jesus said, number one, he's the comforter. And then here's what all that word means. Then the second thing and we've said this, and, and you think I'm, I'm riding this horse too many times, but I'm telling you, this is one of the truths that the body of Christ has not grasped, and it's simply the fact that he says he will abide with us forever. And I'm telling you, you go into some Pentecostal, full gospel, spirit-filled, charismatic, word of faith churches, and I'm telling you, you'd think that the Holy Spirit was as nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I mean, just, just can't hardly settle in. I mean, he's so concerned about it. A baby cries, there went the anointing, you know. 
you kick the cat and for sure you lost it. And they spend, we've already been through that, but they spend all sorts of time begging God to come. Singing the songs, Holy Spirit, fall on me. <laughs> I have a vivid imagination when I hear them singing that. And I thought, if I was the Holy Ghost, I would. I'd just flatten them out. <laughs> But right here, Jesus is teaching us to understand that when he came, he came to stay. He didn't come to visit. And you don't have to dot all the I's and cross all the T's for him to stay. It doesn't, it's okay if a baby cries. It's okay if somebody drops their Bible. It's okay if the praise team hits the wrong note. It doesn't affect the Holy Spirit. And driving to work this morning, how many of you had an opportunity to get in the flesh? <laughs> Have a fleshly manifestation. I'm telling you, this, this town will test you. <laughs> you better, when you're coming to school, be praying in tongues all the way. <laughs> of course, some people think you're saying other words when they see your mouth moving. <laughs> That's their problem. You know what you're doing. You're praying in tongues most of the time. <laughs> but isn't it, isn't it here, here's what, why Jesus so emphasizes this. And the reason we need to emphasize it and the reason we need to fully grasp it is it gives you confidence that you're never alone. I don't care where you are, what you're doing, what you're going through, what you're encountering, you're not doing it by yourself. And this is the reason Jesus could, could do the things he did and boast of it. And he says, the Father is always with me. And once again, moving right on into the New Testament epistles where Paul re really begins to expound upon these things, he, he is telling us, about how if God be for us. He lists all these things that could come up in life, and he says, and what shall we then say to these things? Well, he's saying, here's what you say to them. God's in me. <laughs> so how would you dare be against me? What then shall we say unto these things? If God be for me, then who or what can be against me? And I'm, I, I insert those other words because I just, what or who would dare be against me and God? And this is why it's so important that we understand that, that when I'm sleeping and not even conscious of anything happening, God is just as real and just as present with me as when we get into a beautiful praise and worship service and we're just caught up in recognizing the presence of God. He's no more real then than he was when I was sleeping. And, and all of us have been in services where we begin to almost tangibly feel his presence. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And those are wonderful times, but the, he's not any more real then than he was before you felt it. And, and what causes that, what we sense as a tangible manifestation it's just when we all get on the same page and begin to acknowledge his presence. See, this is what God wants to do when we come together. He, he has told us when two or three of you get together, guess what? I'm right there in the midst. So he's always with us. He's always in where we are. He is here as much as he could ever be here. But then the thing that causes us to sense it is when everybody begins to acknowledge that presence and recognize that presence. That's when you begin to sense or feel his presence. But that's not when he showed up. You know, one of the, one of the things that, that Benny Hinn has discovered, and this is not a pro or a, or a negative against Benny Hinn, this is just an illustration one of the reasons you see so many miracles 
in Benny Hinn's meetings is that he spends about the first hour and 15 minutes getting everybody to zero in on the presence of God. They sing, they praise, they sing the same song over and over, and, and he doesn't get in a hurry. What he's watching is when everybody begins to acknowledge and recognize his presence. And you know what? Here's the scripture. It says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Well, if you'll look up that word inhabit in its simplest definition is makes himself at home. God makes himself at home in the midst of the praises of his people. Now, think about this a minute. We all come in here and to a certain degree, every one of us are putting on some kind of facade. Don't look at me that innocent. <laughs> I've been in ministry too long. You're not going to fool me. What we see here is not what we necessarily would see behind your doors at home. Thank God. <laughs> but when you get home, you know what? You just begin to act like yourself. Are you listening to me? I mean, if, if you like to throw off your shoes and go barefoot and put on your tattered shorts and your holy t-shirt, and I'm talking about holy, not holy. In other words, you just act like yourself. I mean, at home, you're really yourself. And you act like yourself. Well, God says, I make myself at home in the praises of my people. So when God makes himself at home, what does God do? He acts like himself. And so what begins to happen when God acts like himself? People get healed, people get saved, people get delivered, people get born again, people get baptized in the Holy Ghost, because that's just, that's the way God is. And so when all these thousands of people begin to zero in and acknowledge and recognize the presence of God and begin to praise him, he just comes in, acts like himself, and people get healed. It's not anything special formula. It's just acknowledging he's there. Now, folks, when you go out to minister to people, when you get ready to pray for a sick person, you better be meditating on the fact that you're not doing this by yourself. That it's God on the inside of you that's going to release any healing virtue there might be to be released. You need to just understand you do not in yourself have the ability to do it. But you've got God in you who has the ability. So it's so important. And like I say, we drive this home over and over and over because you need to really develop that confidence within yourself that where you are, that's where God is. And God is always on. He doesn't have off days. And let me tell you, over the years that I ministered, the times that I felt the least qualified to minister is when the greatest things happen. And, and this is, you know, just backs up scripture. When you're weak, then he's strong. And then when you realize who he's called, <laughs> Read that list of called people. The weak, the base, the simple. <laughs> Not many wise, it says, are chosen. Because we get caught up in our own wisdom and our own ability and we're not dependent on him. But when you know you can't do anything. Hallelujah. That's what makes it fun. You know, if I quit ever having fun in ministry, I'm quitting. But it's a joy to do what I'm doing. I've been doing this. I was trying to think this morning. I think it's 38 years next month that I've been in full-time ministry. And I didn't say that for any other reason than to tell you I've seen a lot of things happen in 38 years. But I enjoyed as much today, probably more today than I did when I first started because, you know, every day is a new adventure and I found out how to just trust God and rely on him to get these things done. You know, I, I, 
I may be revealing something I shouldn't be revealing, but I didn't spend a lot of time praying and fasting this morning before I <laughs> came to teach. Now, I fast. I, I do scriptural fast, which is daily. It's based upon the first chapter of Genesis where it says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So every night I quit eating. And every morning I break my fast. <laughs> That's why I'm so spiritual, in case you hadn't recognized it. But, you know, you learn to just depend on the Holy Spirit. And, and I told somebody one of the first days that we had, you know, you learn to just depend on the Holy Spirit. And, and I told somebody one of the first days that we had school here. When, when I first went to school here, when, when I first went in the ministry, I didn't have any training. So I really labored. I worked hard to come up with messages. I mean, I'd spend hours and, and I'd have pages of notes and references. I mean, I labored. Uh, and so as a Baptist pastor, one of our customs was that when the service came to a conclusion, we'd call on a church member to pray and we'd dash to the back door where we could shake everybody's hand when they left. Those of you with a Baptist background can relate to that. And those of you that, well, that was our tradition. We did that. So every morning they'd all come out saying, oh, that was good, good message this morning, Pastor. Man, you really stepped on our toes today. And you know, some kind of nice comment. Well, after a little while, I was seeing people come to church every Sunday, but I wasn't seeing much change in their lives, and I began to wonder what's going on here. So one morning this guy came out and he said, Pastor, boy, that was a great message this morning, shaking my hand. I said, well, uh, tell me what it was about. And, and he looked at me and he said, well, I don't remember exactly, but it was life-changing. <laughs> Last time I prepared a message, I said, I'm not going to labor and work and do all this stuff and nobody's. And you know what? I just began to relax and started sharing what God was revealing to me. You know what? Took all the pressure off, took all the burdens off, and, and really gave me a, a joy that I love to stand up and minister. But I don't, I don't labor hours and hours and pray and fast and moan and groan and roll on the floor and agonize. You know, I come with the confidence that I'm doing what God called me to do. Therefore, I'm trusting him to enable me to do it. And I enjoy doing it. And I, I'm still having fun doing it. And I'm going to finish my course with joy. And it's just awesome. I'm, I'm actually busier today than, than I've been in all the 38 years of ministry. I mean, I'm, uh, you'll see I'll be absent a lot from here because I'm doing a lot of traveling to the other 17 schools that we have. And so, you know, come up uh, in, uh, in October, I'll be doing Germany, England, Uganda, and South Africa before I get back. So, and, and yet, every morning I wake up excited about what God's going to do today. And one of the reasons for that is because over the years, I've developed this confidence that it's the Father in me. He does the work. I can just get to go along for the ride. Hallelujah. What a deal. And just watch what God does. So he will abide with you forever. Don't ever forget it. He's with you all the time. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What more does he have to say to assure us that he's always with us? He's always with us. And the Holy Spirit's here to abide forever. Uh, then, uh, you know, it's just amazing to me why some, some people are afraid to teach that security. It's almost like, well, if, if I tell people that, they'll just go out and live like the devil. Not if they're really born again children of God, they won't. Come on. All right, then the third thing he says here is that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Once again, all we have to do is examine ourselves and see what's coming out of our mouth. And you'll know whether it's the Spirit of God or not. Because if it's the Spirit of God, it's going to be truth. 
You know, that's one reason it's so important that every single one of us spend quality time in the Word of God, the written Word of God, and become acquainted with it so that when we can recognize it when the Holy Spirit quickens it. Because all He is going to speak is truth. Everything the Holy Spirit is going to say to you, speak to you, is going to be lined up with a written word. And that's, that helps us because, you know, there, there are a lot of dummies out there. I'm telling you, people that ought to be kicked, drop kicked off the planet, <laughs> that stand up and, and, and you see it all the time, these ministers that, you know, well, I know I've been married to this woman for X number of years, but the Spirit of God spoke to me and told me she wasn't my mate that this other woman was. Told me and told me she wasn't my mate that this other woman was. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> that is not the Holy Spirit. He doesn't lead you to do things contrary to the Word of God. And yet, people blame God all the time for doing dumb stuff. He's the spirit of truth. So everything the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you and talk to you and direct you about is going to be confirmed by the written word. It'll be in agreement. The word and the spirit agree. He won't be speaking falsehoods. I tell you, the Holy Spirit will never leave you to be dishonest, deceitful, backbiting, tail-bearing, bearing false witness, or lying. He's the spirit of truth. Number four, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that should be obvious. We'll see more about that later, but the Holy Spirit is given to believers. We're talking about when He comes in His full manifestation. Number five, verse 26, He'll teach you all things. He'll teach you all things. Now, people have got flaky and weird on this one too. And they'll say, well, I don't need anybody to teach me because I've got a scripture that says the Holy Ghost will teach me all things. And he will. But that doesn't do away with godly teachers that God has set in the body. Ephesians 4.11, and God hath set in the body apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So this scripture does not discount human teachers. But here's, here's what we need to make clear. I can only present to you with facts and knowledge that I have received, but only the Holy Spirit can make those things that are of God real to you. He uses human teachers to call attention to certain truths and revelations but until the Holy Spirit quickens it to you, you haven't been taught. I sometimes illustrate it this way. You know, I could, uh, I could, I, I'm capable, and I'm able, and I'm willing to one day sit down in front of you and put a table out here and give me about an inch and a half prime rib, cooked medium, some horseradish and all juice, and a loaded baked potato with butter and sour cream and chives and bacon bits and cheese. Start off with a nice hot bowl of French onion soup with the cheese and dribbling off the side. And you know, there's a proper way to eat that. You eat the cheese on the outside first, you know. Don't leave that on your bowl. That's disgraceful to leave that cheese on the bowl. 
Then a nice green salad with crumbly blue cheese dressing. And I could sit up here and I could really eat that and I could tell you how good it was. I mean, bite by bite, I could demonstrate. <laughs> and I could finish that meal off. I could either, I wouldn't be upset if it was key lime pie, nice thick slice, or, or a big bowl of, of good bread pudding with a nice sauce on. And, and I could do that and I could lean back and say, <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I could do that. How I many of you know that that wouldn't really satisfy any of you individually? <laughs> you know, the only way it would really be of value to you is if you got to do that yourself, right? Well, see, that's what teachers do. We stand up and we share the Word of God with you that God's revealed to us. But as long as it's just coming from us, it's not really doing you a lot of good. It's when the Holy Spirit takes what we teach and makes it real to you. That's when you've really been taught. And you know, one of the things that uh, when we first started the school back in 1994, uh, Andrew and I were talking about the Bible schools that were going on, and we weren't being critical of them, but we had just never seen much good fruit come out of any of those schools. You saw a lot of cookie-cutter Christians come out of those schools, and they were all trying to imitate the, the, the teacher of the school, even talk like him, act like him, dress like him, and all that kind of stuff. And, and we just thought, this is not what God has asked us to do. And, and of course, you know the scripture from Timothy that God quickened to Andrew was, take the truths that I've revealed to you and present them to other faithful men and women in a fashion that they can become their own truths and they go out and share it with others. And that's, that's how our school works. We don't want anybody leaving here after spending your time in school and go out and when you're ministering to someone say, well, you know, Andrew says, or Wendell says, or any of the other instructors, we want you to go out and be able to minister to people and say, now, you know, God says. We want you to know what God says, and that's what he'll make real to you, and don't go out quoting us. You need to let the Holy Spirit teach you so that you can say, this is what God says. And you can't do that by just watching someone else do it. You've got to get involved with the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit and let Him make these words on this written page become the living words in your heart. Far too many people nowadays are, are doing just what the Pharisees did. And Paul the Apostle says, the letter kills. It's the Spirit that gives life. And all of these truths had to be quickened by the Holy Spirit in you for them to be of any, give any results. And all of us have, have watched it over the years that we see so many people that are just parroting what other ministers have said and you don't see the results because you're just saying the words, but you haven't got the revelation in your spirit. Here's another quick little illustration on that. I mean, you've ever heard the term milk of the word and meat of the word? Anybody ever encountered those? <clears throat> and there's all these so-called preachers out there telling you, well, you know, the meat of the word, that's what I, I get into the deep things of God. <laughs> you know, that, that, that Jesus said, if you're really going to understand the kingdom, how it operates, you're going to have to become as a little child. And you know, little children don't understand deep things. <laughs> Paul says, why is it that you've been so quickly removed from the simplicity that's in Christ? Let me tell you the difference in the meat and the milk. A cow produces milk. But the process, without going into a lot of detail, cows have four stomachs. And when they begin to eat food, it begins to be processed through those four stomachs, and the end product is they produce milk. 
milk is a product of pre-digested food. When you're hearing truths, teachings from other ministers, you're getting milk because we have digested it and now the product is coming from what we've consumed. And it doesn't make any difference what the truth is. If it's coming from another teacher, it's milk. But meat is when you take your knife and go out and slice a steak off the rear end of that cow and you cook it and eat it yourself. In other words, when the scripture is made real to you by the Holy Spirit, that's the meat of the word. When you get it for yourself and it doesn't come out in a pre-digested form. You get it for yourself and it doesn't come out in a pre-digested form. And it has nothing to do with which truth that is. All the years you heard messages on being born again, when you were just hearing them, that was milk. When it became a revelation to you and you experienced it, it became meat. Same thing on all of the truths. And one thing is that you and I have to guard ourselves against because you know what? We live in a day and an age that you guys are smart. You're sharp. I mean, you got high intellects. You can grasp something and, and be able to repeat it you can listen to one of Andrew's teachings and you might have to listen to it twice, but then you could probably teach it just like Andrew. But you know what? It wouldn't have the same impact because at that time, it's not yours. It's still his. But then when the Holy Spirit, it's still his. But then when the Holy Spirit makes that spirit, makes that real to you. And this this is what Andrew, I don't know, well, I've known him for a good while, and, and I know very seldom do you ever hear him giving credit to any other teacher that he's heard a truth from. And his philosophy is, when it becomes real to him, it's his. So he said, I might give you credit the first time that I use it, but after that, it's mine. In other words, it becomes his revelation. And he doesn't have to say, brother so-and-so said, or somebody else said this. This is what God has said. And this is what we want to happen to all you students, is we don't want you to go out here just parroting, mimicking, minor birding what you hear here, and, and just say, you know, it'll infect all of you before you're through here, but you know, you, you hang around this place long enough and you go up and you say to somebody, well, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed. Well, 99% of the time you're lying. You're just saying it because Andrew says it all the time. But it's real to him. Now, if it's real to you, say it. But I mean, so many people have just, you know, you walk up to them, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed. We had a class years ago and uh, in the beginning of the school, and, and it was really notable because every, every time you say something, how are you, Andrew? Oh, I'm blessed. Well, how are you really? I'm really blessed. You know, it's always the same. I'm blessed he, because he believes it. It's real to him. And I told that class, I said, you know what? One of these days I'm going to invent a doll, a talking doll. You can throw it on the floor. You can stomp on it. You can stick it with pins. You can hit it with a hammer, and it's going to say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Believe it or not, that class, as a class gift, then came up with one. I think Andrew threw it away because he didn't think the image quite looked like him. I thought it was a pretty good image. But, but folks, what I'm saying, see, that's real to him, but it's easy when you're around someone to begin to say the same thing. And you don't mean it. It's just coming off, the, off out of your intellect. And it's not the intellect that's going to change lives. It's by the Spirit of God. So let it become real to you by the Holy Spirit. Ask God. Say, make these truths real to me. Make them come alive in me. I don't want to know them just because Andrew said them or Wendell said them or any other teacher said them. Now, real quickly, number six, he'll bring all things to your remembrance. Now, not only scriptures, now he will, but 
He'll bring to your remembrance the things that he's spoken to you about dreams and visions and, and plans and things that he's put in your heart. He'll bring them to your remembrance. And that's what keeps you going. You know, when, when the Lord spoke to me back in 1976 to move to another town and to, to plant a church, to start a church based upon New Testament patterns and principles and and announced to all would, that would hear that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever, and proclaim the full counsel of the Word of God with balance. You know, that was, that was written on my heart. Well, I, if you've never pastored, you don't always realize the challenges that come on. But every time I'd get a little discouraged in that, though he'd bring to my remembrance that commission. He'll bring to your remembrance the things that he's spoken to you. And I remember in the 80s, and I'll probably tell you more about this later, whether you want to hear it or not, it's my class. Uh, but how God began to deal with us back in the 80s that he was sending us to the nations. And you know what? I'm living that now. And, and all the times that it wasn't happened, he'd bring it back to my remembrance. So not only scripture, but whatever he's spoken to you, he'll continue to remind you to keep you on track. But now he also quickened scriptures to you. We were in, uh, in Scotland years ago, Glasgow, Scotland, and, and uh, Andrew was doing a, a, a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, much as he does today, he called the team forward to, to minister to people. And so he got through teaching and, and uh, gave a, an altar call, and my wife and I were up front ministering to people, and this lady came in front of us, and her face was just twisted. I mean, just very distorted. And, we found out she had Bell's palsy. I didn't know anything about that, but it was just terribly distorted, and she wanted prayer for that. Well, Linda and I just laid hands on her and prayed for her, and right bitterly distorted, and she wanted prayer for that. Well, Linda and I just laid hands on her and prayed for her, and right before our eyes, for our eyes, her face totally straightened up. And I mean, we were, wow. You know, probably had a little hardened heart. Because it, it astounded us, and, and it caused no small stir because people knew her and they were seeing her now. And, and so Andrew just stopped and said, what's happening over there? And I said, we just had a great miracle. This lady just, her face was, was twisted, and now it's straight, and everybody clapped and cheered, and then a lot of people got ready for prayer. Well, in a few minutes, we went on praying for people, and, and she came back in front of us, and you could see, and she said, it's coming back. It's coming back. And she would be, begin to cry right out of my mouth. I said, you know what it says in Nahum, I think it's 1 6, maybe 1 9. See, it's not under the Spirit right now. But just right out of my mouth, I said, you know what it says in Nahum 1 6, this affliction shall not arise a second time. Now, I've read the Bible many times, but I've never spent a lot of time studying Nahum. <laughs> and it surprised me. I mean, my ear jumped around and listened to my mouth, see what was coming out, you know. <laughs> I said, open your Bible and let's read that. And, and she opened it. And sure enough, that's what it said. This affliction shall not arise a second time. I, <laughs> Holy Ghost to make you look good. But see, I had read that at some point in time and it was there, but the Holy Spirit brought it to my remembrance at the right time. And she read that. And when she read it out loud, her face straightened back up. And as far as we know, it stayed straight. Just an awesome thing. Well, you know, I can't take credit for that because I didn't, I, I still don't remember if it's 1 6 or 1 9 when I tell the story. What is it? Nine. Somebody looked it up. It's named 1 9. But I knew it that time and I just stated it. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is something else. He'll make you look good, He'll bring all things to your remembrance. And uh, I guess that's the last one. It's bringing to my remembrance. That's the end of the lesson. <laughs>